Today's menu includes looking at the most basic form of the most basic form of an operating system. I'm talking about RIOS, an RTOS in allegedly less than 50 lines of code. First up, what even is an RTOS? RTOS stands for Real-Time Operating System and unlike the operating system you are currently using on a device to watch this video, it ain't gonna run Minecraft for you. An operating system is something that abstracts hardware away from you, so you don't need to worry about the hardware when you're writing JavaScript and it also takes care of running multiple processes on the same hardware, so it creates an illusion that your Asus EEE has 200 cores. A Real-Time Operating System is on the other hand a very stripped down version of an operating system where in its most basic form it's nothing more than a task scheduler with a few extra features as we'll see in a bit. Another difference from a quote unquote real operating system is the way it's deployed. An RTOS is not installed from a USB stick or put on an SD card, it's a part of the actual binary for embedded real-time systems and it's the responsibility of the application developer to use it correctly. In other terms, just think of an RTOS as a task scheduler for Arduino. So instead of only one loop function, you have more of them. Now let's finally look at the item of this video, RIOS. RIOS stands for Riverside slash Irving Operating System as it was developed at these two universities. It comes in multiple flavors and you can check them out at the link in the description. The gist of it is that you pick a version you like and then implement just a few functions which are platform specific. The version of RIOS we'll be looking at today is a port for AVR microcontrollers which is listed as an example example on their website. Specifically this code is targeted for the Atmega 324P chip which conveniently is the same chip as found on Arduino Uno. Luckily I have one lying around so we'll test the code on it later in the video. I copied the source code from the website and opened it in my editor so we can navigate it more easily. Let's just slowly walk through the code and talk about what's going on. So at the top right after includes and processor frequency setting we have the definition of a task. As you can see it has a running field that indicates if the task is currently running or not then it has a state field if you want to have the state machine tasks we're just gonna ignore that for our purposes then a period field defines the tick rate of the task in other words how often should the task be ran then we have an elapsed time field which allows the scheduler to check how much time has passed since the last tick and finally the most important field named tick fct is a pointer to a function which takes an integer argument and it returns an integer value now we know how the tasks look like so the next thing is to define the tasks array which has room for three tasks then we declare the tick rates for these tasks and below them we declare the free task handler functions which are then defined at the bottom of the file. The next thing is actually a typo and then we create an array of running tasks which contains one element more than the tasks array and it already includes an always active idle task. This array will contain the priorities of the tasks and priority in RIOS is defined by the place of the task in the tasks array. So in our case task 1 has the highest priority and task 3 has the lowest. Then below these definitions this next block is the heart of the scheduler but to understand what it actually does let's first scroll past it to reach our main function. So the main function as you might already know is the entry point to our program and the first thing it does is it calls the init processor function so let's take a look at that first. Now this function might look scary to you but hold my hand and there's nothing to worry about. These constants are just addresses to registers provided by the AVR library and the operations we are performing on them are bit manipulations. For example 
This first line writes the hex value of ff to the register located at the address pointed to by the constant port b. By the way, I have no idea why SPI is being enabled in this example. Or for example, the next line sets these two bits in the tccr1b register. To get an idea what impact these operations actually have, one needs to read the documentation of the actual microcontroller. Anyways, the important thing to take away from this function is that we enable an interrupt on the timer every so and so cycles. And interrupts, if you don't know, are signals that come from different peripherals or the outside world and essentially the processor stops everything it's doing and goes to handle the interrupt and after that it resumes whatever it has been doing. So now that we know what interrupts are, let's scroll back up to the place we said contains the heart of the scheduler. The way that the syntax for this interrupt handler looks like using this macro here is AVR specific and it might look completely different with different microcontroller brands or manufacturers. Essentially what this does, it, it registers an interrupt handler for the timer1 compa vector. So basically for the interrupt we enabled in the init processor function. Inside this function, the first thing we do is we loop over all the tasks from the task with the highest priority to the task with the lowest one. So when we reach a task that has higher priority than the one that's currently running, we set its state and then run it and after it's being run, we update its state again. An interesting observation is the writes to the sreg register, and what these writes do is they guard the state updating code by disabling interrupts and then enabling them again. For example, we disable interrupts here so that no other interrupts can occur while this piece of code is being executed, and when we reach this line, we enable interrupts again so that tasks can preempt each other. You can look at this writes to sreg register as a sort of mutex so that we avoid any potential data races. So as I said, the task execution itself isn't being guarded. So that means that a task with higher priority can stop the currently running task, execute itself, and then resume the low priority task. Going back to the main function, the only thing left to be done is to populate the tasks array with tasks. And after we do that, we just run an infinite loop which does nothing because the whole logic is handled via interrupts. Below the main function are the definitions of task handlers I mentioned earlier. Currently, each of them just wastes a few CPU cycles and does nothing. And now is finally the time to plug in the USB cable and connect it to Arduino because we are going to put our scheduler to the test. To make things a bit more fun, I'll connect three LEDs to the Arduino and we're going to have our scheduler toggle them on and off. Back in the editor, we first need to increase the task periods so we'll actually see the switches. I chose one, two and three seconds periods for our three tasks respectively. Then in our init processor function, right before we enable global interrupts, we need to initialize our free GPIO pins that the LEDs are connected to as outputs. We do that by setting bits in the DDRB register. And finally, in the task handlers themselves, we remove the delay functions and replace them with XOR bit flips in the port B register. The XOR operation sets this bit if it wasn't already set and resets it if it was already set. Essentially, each task toggles the state of its LED on each tick. To build the code, we need to have AVR toolchain installed. I'll create a new file called build.sh and paste in the commands for building and flashing the firmware. Now this script just takes in one single mandatory argument, which is the USB port of the Arduino. Then it uses GCC to compile our C file and produce a binary named rios.bin. The next command basically just converts the produced binary and turns it into a hex file. And then finally, we use a utility called avrdude to flash the produced hex file onto the port we passed in as the argument. In the terminal, we need to add run permissions to the script. 
and then run it by providing the port as an argument. As soon as the firmware is flashed, the LEDs start blinking. And if you take the time, you can see that they are being toggled at appropriate intervals. This was real-time operating system in 96 lines of C. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again.